my name is Barton Damer. I am the owner and founding artist of a studio called Already Been Chewed. You can find us online at alreadybeenchewed.tv. You could also find us on Instagram or Facebook at Already Been Chewed. Uh, or if you would like to follow my personal accounts, it's at Barton Damer. Um, we are a studio of uh, eight people. And uh, you can see our team there in the middle. We have Mark, Brian, Thomas, uh, Lance, my wife, Sandra, uh, myself, uh, Aaron, and then uh, another one of our guys, Donnie, is not shown in that photo, unfortunately. Uh, you can see also pictures of our studio space and uh, the creative environment we've tried to create for ourselves there. Uh, it's an old historical building built in the late 1800s. Uh, we bought it about two years ago, uh, renovated it, and uh, have been enjoying uh, just trying to make some really cool work out of this space. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is show you our latest motion graphics reel. I'm actually really excited to show this reel because with the exception of maybe one or two clips, uh, all of the work in this reel has been done in the last, uh, I'd say, 12 to 15 months. So all of the work that you saw in this motion graphics reel is being done in Cinema 4D. Uh, and what we're going to look at today is how uh, we're integrating Cinema 4D into our pipeline, go over some tips and tricks on a particular project that we've done uh, recently. Uh, it's also worth noting that we have started integrating Houdini into our pipeline as well. And that's working very seamlessly with uh, Cinema 4D. Uh, and so some of the uh, water simulations and smoke simulations that you saw in there uh, were us beginning to integrate uh, Houdini into our pipeline a little bit more. So let's take a look at the project that we're going to go over today. And uh, we'll talk about how valuable cinema was um, in allowing us to be able to create this type of uh, artwork. Um, so one of our international clients is called Xstep Footwear. Uh, they are a brand out of China. And so uh, what we typically do when we're working with clients is we have a, a concept phase, a style board phase, and an animation phase. And typically in the concept phase, we are not only working with the client to develop the creative uh, work around a script and uh, form sketches and things like that, but part of our concept phase, once those things are flushed out, is creating what uh, might be the key visual from the spot that we're working on. And a lot of times that key visual goes on to be used for print assets, digital, non-digital assets as well. And so uh, when we're developing that key visual, we're working with the client the, to really set the tone for what the rest of the project is going to look like. So we're trying to figure out, you know, for instance, if you, as you look at an image like this, is it going to be outside or is it going to be a more of like a full CG environment with graphics around it, more motion graphics-y feeling, things like that. So, uh, you know, we established that it's going to be daylight, it's going to be outside on uh, basically a concrete sidewalk. 
uh, we start establishing what this concrete wave is going to look like and uh, designing the wave to reinforce some of the designs in the midsole of the shoe. Uh, so we have basically like a diamond pattern that is cracking and forming this wave. Uh, and that's uh, inspired by the midsole of the shoe that's made in like a diamond pattern. Uh, we also took cues from the shoe where there's kind of like paint splatters, uh, not only in the midsole, but in some of the designs on the upper of the shoe. And so there's texturing within the kind of cracked wave uh, that feels like scraped paint uh, or splattered paint has been um, hit ag along the bottom side uh, of the wave. So during this concept phase, those are all the things that we're going over with the client and trying to figure out, uh, you know, basically a direction for a look and a vibe for the spot. And that's going to affect all the other decisions that are played out uh, throughout the remainder of the project. So once we have approval on uh, a key visual like this, we would move into what we call the style board phase. And in the style board phase, we would go into, uh, again, just key frames throughout the project that start to communicate what we've already flushed out on paper, through sketches, things like that. Uh, but now we're actually building it in 3D. And during this process, the animations are very rough. Like you would notice one of the, uh, the top left is a uh, actual simulation. So it's hard to create a style board without doing some animation. But the goal is don't worry about perfecting your animations. Just get it enough visually that it can communicate what's going to happen. And then we can allow the client to sign off on composition, lighting, uh, if there's text involved or graphics involved, those are all of the things that the, we're dealing with the client and talking to them about and saying, hey, please approve this at this stage. You know, do you like this camera angle? Because we're going to base our, our animations and our simulations, say, of like smoke coming through the midsole. We're going to base that off of this type of a camera angle. And so those are all of the key frames that uh, we would go over with the client. Uh, throughout the project and try to get approval on those before we kick into the animation phase. So now let's take a look at what the actual full completed spot uh, looks like based off of boards like this. And so you can see the spot turns out very similar to the style boards that we present. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to our great team at ABC, as we saw their photo before. Um, we have a lot of fun together. We have a very open work environment, as you saw uh, in the pictures previously. And so it's really fun to be able to bounce ideas off of each other and solve problems as we go through a spot like this. Before we jump into the actual Cinema 4D files, I want to show you kind of a behind the scenes edit that goes back and forth between uh, the high res renders and also some like wireframe hardware previews inside of Cinema. And then one, uh, one little thing that I wanted to point out on this video footage. Uh, we were contemplating how to go about shooting this. And then obviously, uh, as you saw, we like 3D tracked and added the cracks in as he was running. And uh, so we had on set a uh, Movicam operator ready to kind of like run with him and try and chase him down, things like that. Uh, but it, it, the whole setup was a little too cumbersome, and this guy was sprinting really fast. He was pretty tall. He's probably like 6'3", and so uh, his, his stride and things like that was, was very fast. And so uh, a friend of mine who's at NAB today uh, was on the shoot, and uh, he and I followed him on skateboards because we couldn't keep up with the Movican, so we just ditched it. And so this spot and another spot that we worked on for X-Step 
was all filmed uh, holding a big red camera and just chasing him full speed uh, on a skateboard along Manhattan Beach and LA area. All right, so let's dive into the actual Cinema 4D file and take a look around. Uh, we are going to be going over uh, a couple different things today. Redshift is one of the things that we'll look at. This is kind of a low-res uh, preview from the hero image in the Redshift render view. Uh, if I go ahead and click play, it will load it up. I had paused it previously. You'll notice it's preparing the scene, and then it starts to do what's called a progressive rendering. If you're not familiar with progressive rendering, it basically starts out, uh, it gives you very quick results, it's kind of grainy, and then over time it'll continue to get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. Uh, but this is super advantageous when you are working in cinema, uh, because as you move around, uh, you can see that it will update, and it'll update pretty quickly, and then it'll continue to clear up. Uh, and it's nice too, because you can, uh, you can then go in and you can, um, add images and save them so you don't have to do like a complete render and, and wait for it and things like that. Uh, so we will be looking at Redshift uh, a little bit further in more detail uh, later on in the presentation. For now, let's just take a look at the actual scene from this hero image. And you'll notice, uh, you know, when we're in our, our camera view, that is, I'm going to go ahead and pause uh, the Redshift render view. I should close it out. So you'll notice when we're in this view, it's a very full scene, uh, and it gives us all the detail that we needed. Uh, but the th kind of fun and interesting thing about 3D is if you pull out and look at the whole scene, uh, there's not a whole lot to it. Um, so you know, one of the ways we save render time is by only building out what needs to be seen in the camera view at that time. Uh, and so this is the entirety of our scene for this particular hero image. OK, so uh, what we're going to do now is we are going to look at some of the uh, techniques that were used as we created this basically concrete wave. So we're going to look at how the wave was formed, uh, also how it was cracked and shattered. And we'll look at some animation techniques. And so after we form this wave, then we will jump into Redshift and look at some texturing and lighting techniques as well. So uh, let's start in a brand new document. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to create that diamond uh, that we need to work with. So um, just dropping in a cube and um, scaling down the size. I'm going to go into my four views, showing the top perspective, the right, and the front. And what I want to do is I want to make it editable by uh, pressing the C key. And then I want to change my axis. Right now, my axis is treating this like it's a square, but I want to work with it like it's a diamond. So if I click on my axes tool, I'm just going to rotate my axes 45, click Apply. Now I'm going to go uh, away from my axes mode just by clicking on it. And then I don't want it on a 45 degree rotation, so I'm going to go back to 0. And now I'll be able to work with this as more of a diamond. <coughs> so if I go into point mode now, what I want to do is uh, grab the outside edges. And I want to scale them in to create a diamond. So uh, what's important to notice is if you scale from just clicking on the outside in and pull it down, if you come down here to this window, now you're seeing it kind of goes up and down, which is not really what we want. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to scale by grabbing the red handle only. And then I will pull that in, and I will get my diamond shape. So one thing that you'll notice, if we were to just click Render right now, the edges are very hard and crisp and look uh, relatively fake and CG. So we want to solve for that. And we're going to solve for that by using a deformer object. So if I come in here and I add the bevel deformer, if you're not familiar with the parent-child relationship that um, is kind of like the basis for uh, using deformers inside of cinema, we want to drop this down inside of the cube. And so that makes it a child of what uh, the cube would be considered the parent at that point. And so now when we drop it in, you can zoom in and you can see that it is affecting the edges there. 
Now, the edges are still uh, not looking great, and that's p in part because we only have, uh, well, we have zero subdivisions, so it's, it's only creating one plane between uh, our creases there. So if I change this to three, then hit render again, you'll notice that they're starting to soften out and look a lot better. And then, of course, we can change the offset and exaggerate this quite a bit if we wanted to. Uh, and then we could increase or de decrease our subdivisions. And so uh, that's a, a nice, quick, easy way to do some modeling inside of Cinema. So uh, now let's go back to our four camera views. And what we want to do is make this more uh, tapered. So let's pull up our image that we're looking at here. And so you'll see that the bottoms uh, of each diamond shape are quite a bit more tapered. So we wanted to uh, accomplish that tapering uh, by going into uh, our bottom view. And then I'm, I'm going to select all of the points. And when I do that, you'll notice from this view it has selected absolutely all of my points. Well, I want to click only select uh, visible elements. And now when I drag, it's only going to select those bottom points. So it's a quicker way to accomplish it. And unlike the first time that we scaled this diamond, this time we do want to click from over here so that it'll taper everything together. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it. So now we have a decent uh, diamond shape to work with. If I click render, we've got decent edges on it. Let's go back to our image again. And so uh, obviously you could spend a lot more time perfecting the shape of this, but that's the general idea. Now let's look at how we actually clone this and uh, begin forming our wave shape. So what we want to do is we want to take this cube and we want to drop it into what's called a MoGraph cloner object. And when I drop it into a cloner object, it is automatically, by default, uh, cloning on a what's called linear mode. I'm going to change this to a honeycomb array. And when I do that, I'm going to zoom out. And you'll see that it has added all these different clones uh, on the orientation of Z. I'm going to change that to Y here. And now I can drag these handles. There's little yellow dots on the edges of my cloner. Uh, and I can drag them in, and I can get them really close. And what I want to do is I want to line these up so that they are just barely overlapping. And if I have them so that they're just barely overlapping, they will seamlessly go into my concrete sidewalk. And so you'll notice that the edges just went away when I uh, had them barely overlap. So now if I hit render, you don't see any of the edges here. So let's go back to the image uh, so that you know a little bit more what I'm referring to. So we have all these cracks that are at the top of our concrete wave. And then you can see as it gets lower and lower and lower, you see a little bit of cracking here, and eventually it goes seamlessly into the ground. So by creating that little bit of an overlap, that's where we get like the seamless effect. So if I mimic the shape of what we had before, I'm going to just, I want to be able to see some of these a little bit more. So I'm going to go into quick shading lines, and now I can see the outline of them. Uh, I'm just going to add to the width of this. I'm also going to add to the length of it so that we can get something a little bit closer to our hero image that we've been looking at. OK, and so now the way we're going to create this concrete wave is we're going to use what's called uh, an FFD deformer. So within our deformers, uh, we go to FFD. And I want to group my FFD with my cloner. And so if I group them together, the FFD will affect everything that's inside of the null. If I happen to drag the FFD inside of the cloner, it'll fill kind of gaps. So you'll have a cube, a blank space for the FFD or a cube, or the FFD might affect only the cube itself. So keep in mind, you want the FFD to affect everything that's inside of this null. You'll notice right now, if you can see that it is this cube-shaped deformer. 
uh, and it is not the size of our wave. We want that FFD to basically go just outside the edges of everything so that when we deform it, it will deform it properly. Uh, so a quick way that I'm going to do that, rather than entering in uh, coordinates on the grid size, is I'm just going to drop in a cube. And uh, that will allow me to kind of just quickly pull the length and the width of it. Uh, and then what I'm just going to do is put the FFD inside of the cube and click Fit to Parent. And now you can see my FFD is the side size of this cube. I'll just bring it back inside the null. I don't need that cube anymore. And it was just a little bit faster than me kind of guessing the grid size here. So we have our grid points, and we want to add a lot more of these. So let's take a look at what happens. You'll notice we're adding grid points along our x axes. That might be enough for what we're doing. We may come back and adjust that. And then we're going to add more grid points along our z. So. Uh, Now, what this is going to allow us to do is we're going to go into uh, point level animation. So if I click on these, uh, the, the points here, that will allow me to see all of the points of the FFD. And if you go down to this button here, it is your point level animation. And so by clicking on this and making it active, I can set a keyframe for all of the points here. So I'm going to set a keyframe here, and then I'm going to go down to, say, 30. And now I'm going to start pulling the points to manipulate this concrete wave. So um, let's see. Let me just drag the middle right now. Only select visible elements is on. I want to make sure that's checked off so that I'm grabbing all of the points within that FFD. So just be careful of that. Now I'm going to start to manipulate these points. And you can see, uh, by doing this, I'm going to go ahead and set a keyframe. I'm starting to get the shape of our concrete wave, uh, excuse me, of our concrete wave that we're looking at. And so that's all done with a simple deformer of the FFD. Now, this wave is still not quite the shape that we want. Uh, as we were creating this wave, some things to note that were important in the, I guess, artistic style of the wave is that where the shoe was compressing, it's not, as, it's not broken up quite as much. And then it actually bows out and breaks on the edges. And so uh, we're going to start looking at how we created that effect and how uh, we could break it up on just the edges and not have to have like the entire concrete wave broken up. So as we go back into this file, um, let's create the bow that I was just talking about on the edges. So I'm going to grab just the outside edges, and I will pull those up. May need to go a little more extreme, grab the middle ones here. And so now we're getting kind of that compression point where the shoe will touch the concrete wave. And since we are in point level animation, I want to go ahead and add a keyframe so I don't lose uh, the manipulating of the wave that I just did. Uh, and so just kind of a side note on the animation. Uh, typically, we focus on what things look, for, look like first. Uh, and then we go into animation. But obviously, you want to be thinking through the entire process if possible. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to go down a path of doing all of this animation and then the client decides they don't like the shape of the wave. Uh, so we're kind of balancing the line as we're working with these clients and creating style boards on focusing on what it looks like. And then once that gets approved, focusing on the animation of it. But that being said, uh, since we are at this stage, we can look at one way that you could animate this concrete wave. Remember, I added a keyframe at the zero point earlier. So uh, now we essentially have the shape of our wave. And if I go back to zero, it's completely flush with the sidewalk. And if I hit play, you'll see that the entire concrete wave rises up and forms the shape that we want. So that's definitely one way that you could animate this concrete wave. And we'll look at uh, another technique that was used a little bit later in the project uh, today. So I'm actually going to delete this 
original zero point keyframe because I don't need it um, for the focus of what we're doing right now. Uh, so we've got kind of the arch of our wave working for us. Now let's go ahead and break it up. And as mentioned before, it's important that when we break it up, we're breaking it up on the edges, and then we don't want it to be broken up at the ground here. So let's look at how we focus our attention on that. So uh, we're going to use what's called a MoGraph random effector. So you have to go into the cloner, and under effectors, you can tell it which effectors in your scene uh, you want it to be affected by. So we drag our random down into our effectors. And now all of a sudden, uh, we have the concrete wave completely broken up into pieces. And if I hit render here, um, you know, this is not exactly what we want, right? Because we talked about we wanted it to be smooth and we wanted it to go into the concrete itself and not be broken up everywhere. So let's look at how we can solve for that. Let's take our random effector. And in the fall off, right now it's set to infinite, which means it's going to affect everything everywhere inside of that cloner object. But there's, uh, you know, we want to focus our attention on what's being randomized. So I'm going to change this to box. And when I change it to box, right now it's down here, and it's this tiny little box. And it's affecting just a few of the clones. So let's change the size of it. Uh, I'm just going to guess right now maybe 600 all around. OK, so we're getting a little bit closer. You see it's breaking up the entire area here. And then we're going into the seamless uh, concrete wave on this side. Uh, so what we can do is simply just adjust our position of it. And so now it's breaking up on the edges the way we wanted it to break up. And we'll just create a duplicate of it. I'm holding down the Control key and just making a copy so that the settings are all the same. I've got the same fall off, things like that. And then I'm going to move it over to the side. You'll notice it's not affecting the wave right now. And that's because we need to make sure we do the step that we did earlier. And that is to drag the random effector into uh, this uh, window here so that it affects uh, exactly the area that we want to, um, accidentally moving my wave there. So if I move the random effector more to the edge, then you can see I'm only breaking up here. And just you know, you take time to position these things. Now, one thing to notice uh, that could be a big problem as we go into animation is these diamonds are actually intersecting with each other. Um, so if I click render, you'll notice that they're actually like touching and, and intersecting with each other, which is not something that we want. We want them to like function properly when they are animated. So there's a lot of different ways you could go about solving for this. You could use dynamics and actually simulate real collisions between the diamonds so that as it cracks, they hit each other and don't intersect or overlap. Uh, you could definitely do that. But one of the challenges we were up against is we have these shoes running. And there's going to be probably six to eight steps in one Cinema 4D file. And as we generate the six to eight steps, as we were looking at before, uh, let me pull up our, our main scene here. So you can imagine this is only one of the concrete waves. And then where we had scenes where we had to run with two shoes, the issue you run into is now you've got six to eight steps all within the same file you're multiplying this many clones, and you're applying dynamics to every single one of those steps. Plus, you're also going to have to build out your background to follow six to eight steps. So this scene that started out as relatively minimal is going to become a very heavy scene very quickly. So what we did uh, was really just a very simple solve for that. Um, let's go into our random effector. We're going to try to affect both of them at the same time. If I, let's just exaggerate what we have here, just so we know exactly what we're talking about. If I go and do 150, 150, you can see the collisions a little bit better. So uh, the way we just solved that, again, very simple solution. We just took and made the x and the z 0. And so now when it randomizes, it's only going to randomize the diamonds up or down, and they won't intersect with each other. And so it was a really simple way to avoid having to process dynamics, process collisions, 
Uh, and then from the camera angles that we were using, it just felt like they were a little bit more organic and then would come back uh, together and flatten with the, uh, the concrete itself. So simple solve there. Our next step that we want to do is uh, we're going to begin looking at uh, redshift and how to light and texture in redshift. And so we'll bounce back and forth a little bit between lighting and texturing. Uh, because as you adjust your lights, your textures change. And if you don't start adding textures, then your, your lights don't look quite the same as well. So uh, we will do a little bit of lighting and texturing at the same time. So right now, I'm just adding in a ground plane to serve as like our concrete texture here. OK, so if I hit Render now, um, you can see it doesn't look great. Uh, so now we're going to start taking some steps to improve this. If you're not familiar with the Redshift Renderer, uh, it is a third-party photorealistic render engine. Um, and let's pull up the Redshift Render View. We were looking at it a little, a little bit earlier. If I click Play right now, I get real-time rendering, and I can see the results of it very quickly. Um, but first step we want to do is we want to add a little bit of lighting in here to try to improve this look. So what I would typically do first when lighting something is I would go into lights and I would add what's called a dome light. And the dome light by default just gives you a little bit of lighting to work with, but you'll want to go in and choose some sort of an HDR to uh, begin lighting your scene. I'm typically using an HDR in scenes, even if it's just as like a fill light, and then going back in with area lights to really control the way uh, I want it to look. So uh, let's find, here's a HDR sky sunset. So I'm loading that into my dome light. I'm going to give it a second to update here. And now if I move the camera around, you can see I have a sky in position. And you can see my light source. So uh, one thing we'll do now that we have this lighting in here is we'll begin adding some redshift textures. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and drop in a redshift camera. And so I'm using a standard camera. I'm going to make it active. And then I'm just going to set a keyframe to this position. Uh, and that way, when I move around, it'll just snap right back uh, to this view. I'm choosing this view because as we put our texture in, that sunset in the background is going to help us see what's happening, not only with our reflectance, but our, our normal map uh, and displacement as well. So let's go ahead and create our first texture. We're going to go Redshift Materials Material. And then if I drag that onto my plane, by default, it's super glossy. It looks almost like a mirror. So let's take steps to solve for that. If we go into Edit Shader Graph, <clears throat> OK, now we've entered a whole nother world of nodes. Uh, and I've been working in 3D for over 10 years now. And Redshift was the first time I've ever worked with nodes before. And I was a little bit intimidated and frustrated by it um, because I just hadn't done that before. And I felt like. If I've done 3D for 10 years, I shouldn't have to look up a tutorial of how to add a bump map or a normal map. I should know how to do that. Thankfully, there are a lot of good resources online, and I did look up a tutorial. And, uh, and then nodes became a lot less intimidating to me. So what I'm going to show you is just some really basic node texturing uh, that will get you very far in life if you can accomplish these, say, three or four things that we're about to look at. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to load a photograph of concrete into our textures. And so I'm pulling a texture node in here. It's an RS texture node. And I'm going to drag the node to this blue corner. And I'm going to load a texture into the diffuse color. So uh, I have the option now of choosing a photograph. And I'm going to go into my texture folder. And I'm going to choose a photograph of concrete. And this photograph of concrete is something that you could you know, download online from various resources um, while we were 
on Manhattan Beach filming this. I also used my iPhone and just took photographs of the concrete itself. Uh, so there's a variety of ways that you could obtain uh, photographs for textures. Now, when I drag that texture node and make it active here, you'll notice that we're seeing the concrete just a little bit, but it's still crazy reflective. So let me come up here to this view where we can actually see it a little bit better. And now you can see the photograph of my concrete has been loaded in here. So uh, let's go back and solve for how glossy this is and why it looks like a mirror. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to copy this texture. And I just held down the control key, and it made a duplicate copy of that node. And I'm going to choose a black and white image um, of the concrete for my reflectance channel. And so what it's doing is it's going to be reading my black and white values, my gray values. And depending on if it's black or if it's white, it's going to determine how glossy or how matte it's going to be. And so you may have seen a lot of things uh, maybe on Instagram or online uh, where people are doing like wet roads and part of the road is glossy and part of it's dry. You would use this type of a technique to accomplish that. So uh, just for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to load in an image that uh, was not based off of this concrete texture because uh, it's got a little more contrast. And then that'll show us uh, the, the technique that I'm talking about here. So if I load this uh, photograph in here, now I'm going to go back to the blue corner, and I'm going to load into my reflection, my reflection roughness. And so again, it's going to read those kind of black, white, and gray values to determine um, what's going to be glossy and what's going to be matte. So if we go back now into here, and let's move our camera over a little bit, you can see what I'm talking about now. We have areas that are matte and areas that are glossy. And it's 100% uh, dependent upon the type of image that we load into, uh, into our nodes here. Uh, so super shiny still, and then a little bit more matte. So uh, one way we can solve for how shiny this actually is, is we can just go into our gamma override, click Enable, and we can pull that down. And you can you know, spend time tweaking this. But you get the general idea that now we've got something that uh, is going to look a little more realistic to concrete. And it's going to read those gray values for, for how shiny or how, or how matte it is. The next thing we want to do, uh, because right now it's still just a flat photo uh, with reflectance. But we wanted it to actually interact in 3D space with the lights. And so we need to load what's called a normal map. So I'm just going to type in here, normal, bring in the normal map. And let's see, so now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to connect this again to my blue corner. I'm going to go into overall bump input. And now we have the option of loading a normal map. So you'll see I have a variety of normal maps uh, inside of my view uh, viewer here. And when I load a normal map, I'm going to find one. Um, let's use this one because it's a little more exaggerated. Uh, so for the purpose of this demonstration, we'll be, actually, we'll be able to see the effects of the normal map a little bit better. So when you load a normal map into this, now you'll see that our ground has a lot of depth to it. And if I move the camera around, you can see that we're actually getting uh, real light, real shadows that are interacting with it. Our reflectance is too strong, so we may go in and uh, load a different type of texture for our reflectance. Uh, we can also adjust the gamma on those things. Uh, but for now, let's just change that out since we've gone past that version. OK, so that's our bump map. The last thing we want to look at is the displacement map. So if you combine photo texture with your reflectance, um, your normal map, and your displacement, uh, you're going to be able to get some really, really photorealistic results. So uh, with the displacement, 
It's a little bit different than what we've been looking at. You'll need a displacement node, but this time around, it's not going into the RS material. It's actually going to go into your output. And when it goes into your output, we now have the option to add displacement here. So um, let's see. what we want to do to be able to displace is we need another RS texture. So I'm going to hold down Control key, make a copy of that. And then I'm going to choose, again, just like another more extreme version to work with that's black and white. That way we can see the effects of it a little bit better. And I'm just going to go texture map. Now you'll notice it actually didn't do much. We didn't see anything happen. The reason for that is because we need what's called a redshift tag on it. And so we go into our tags, redshift tags, redshift object. And now within our geometry, we want to click Override and Displacement Enabled. And so if I go back, let's just uh, let's remove our normal map now so we can kind of see the difference uh, between the two. We have uh, some displacing that's happening. And let's see. Let's change our scale value on it, see if we can notice it a little bit more. And let's go into our, let's see, our scale height here. Turn to zero. OK. Um, let's go back to our main view. I'm going to reconnect, uh, let's see, reconnect my bump input. And so you can see quite a bit of tweaking is needed at this point. But in general, with your bump, excuse me, with your node setup, you're working with your, you're working with photo textures inside of your diffuse, inside of your reflection, inside of your bump, and inside of your displacement. So now if we go back to our actual scene file, let me hit pause on this. Let's go back to our original camera view. And if I hit play, essentially the same exact process that we looked at is applied to every single texture you see in here. So whether it's the shoe, uh, or whether it's the concrete or the, uh, you know, foliage, things like that. Uh, you can use all those nodes to get you an initial start on getting your textures uh, looking really good. Now, the next thing we want to do is look at lighting inside of uh, Redshift. Now, we added, a, uh, we added an HDR image earlier to this. Uh, so let's look at um, let's look at different ways to tweak this uh, a bit more. So if we go into the HDR image, we have what's called our exposure, and this will allow us to really like dim it or increase it quite a bit. So you can see if I go to this direction, I'm blowing out my scene. I'm typically trying to use this as more of like a fill light, um, and so. What I want to do is I want to add uh, what's called an area light. So I'll go into lights, area light. And you'll notice right now it's, it's really small. It's over here. And so I'm going to increase the size of it, and you'll start to see where the location of it is. Then I'm just going to go into my uh, top view here and start to pull the lights into different uh, directions. So I'm just going to do 
kind of like a two-point lighting and use my HDR as like uh, overall fill for everything. Obviously, with more time, you would you would tweak this and and work on it uh, quite a bit more to massage the look of it, get it to look better. And so let's look at what my lights are doing right now. I'm going to go ahead and give this light a little more extreme colored, uh, not because I want it to look this way, but just because I really want to see what the results are. I could go into the intensity multiplier and just crank that up a little bit. And now I can start to see where my lights are hitting from. My other one, I'm just going to give it a really, really cool, exaggerated light so that I can see what it's actually doing inside of here. OK, so I've got two lights. Uh, and then I also have uh, the HDR uh, in here. And one thing we want to look at is uh, the, <coughs> the Redshift environment. And so this is where Redshift really stands out and does uh, some incredible things. With the redshift environment, we go into what's called the volume scattering. This is going to allow for basically like fog or haze to come into our scene. So inside of the environment, we can affect every single light at one time, essentially based off of these settings. Uh, or we could go into the individual lights and add more or less fog on them. So what I'm talking about here is if I go into my volume, let's look at one. If I go into my volume here, contribution scale, the moment I click this up, you can start to see a little bit of environment is being added here. And I can crank this up a little bit more. And so this is going to give us some really nice, realistic, atmospheric effects uh, by being able to control that. So you could go into each light and add its own amount of fog. And then, as I was saying earlier, you could go back into the environment tag and you could control the overall scene by cranking this up. And it'll affect every single light that you have applied volume to at one time. So you could crank that more or you could crank that less. And then uh, the last thing I want to show you in lighting of Redshift uh, is let's look at our original image here. And so you'll notice on the shoe itself, there's a cool light on the heel, and there's a really strong um, light, kind of like a rim light, on the toe of the shoe. And so we weren't able to accomplish that uh, except being able to use tags inside of Redshift that exclude everything else around it. And so Redshift is what we call a biased renderer. Because if you were to use, say, an unbiased renderer, what was happening was in order to get the shoe to be this bright on the edge or this bright on the heel, it would blow out the rest of the scene. But we really wanted to highlight the contours of the shoe so we can tell the lights to affect only the shoe itself. So let's, uh, let's go into that scene and look at that setting. So as we load this back up, just give uh, Redshift a second to process all the 8K textures that are in this file. OK, so now what, uh, what we're talking about is inside of this null, we have our shoe. And then we also have three lights here. And these lights are going to affect only the shoe itself. So if I go into the light itself here, under Project, you'll notice that I'm telling the light to only see the shoe. Let me hit pause. Sorry, accidentally hit play over here. So let's go back. One second. My wave was animated there, so it went down. So you'll see what happens if I take the heel light and I tell it to see everything in the scene, not just the shoe. Now what happens is 
it starts to hit the concrete wave and it starts to blow out the concrete wave. Uh, you'll also see it here if I delete the light that's on the toe. You can see that that light is now affecting the entire scene and the entire concrete wave and it's starting to blow it out. Whereas before we wanted it to only uh, hit the shoe. And so that's one of the advantages in lighting in Redshift is that you can tell it to only see the shoe and then it no longer blows out or affects the things that are around it. Uh, so one last time before we close up, um, these techniques were some of the techniques that we used in order to be able to create this spot. So, thank you very much for having me. And uh, again, if you would like to connect with us online, you can find us in our info uh, here.